everybody. Welcome to It Was Tuesday, the podcast about fighting games with your host, James Chen, a.k.a. Jay Chenzor. One of the things that I wanted to try to do a lot more often here on It Was Tuesday is kind of just talk about a little bit more of the history of the fighting game community, talk about things that have happened a long time ago, and just, you know, just kind of contrast with the stuff that we have been doing these days and how the fighting game community has changed. So if you take the time to listen to this whole thing and you're really enjoying it over here, please drop a comment. Tell me, James, more of this. I want to hear more of this stuff. And again, uh, like I said, like and subscribe as always to youtube.com slash TV. I already talked about uh, Street Fighter VI, the Kami versus Manon match. Uh, you can check out the Tekken 8 video uh, tomorrow where I analyze Jack and Jun. Uh, but for this topic here, I want to talk about, you know, last week uh, I talked about how like, you know, players when new games come out, they get angry because it doesn't play like the old game, etc, etc. Well, it's interesting because, you know, when a brand new game comes out today, what happens, right? What happens? Everybody jumps into training mode and they just start labbing everything. And then you just sit there on Twitter and you're like, here's this tech. You know, it'll be hashtag SF6 underscore, you know, Kim, etc. And everybody's just going to be coming up with tech. And the amount of information we find is so fast and it's crazy. And thank you for the gifts of Maka Killing Bird. Thank you very much for the gifts of Decase Money over there. And, you know, dude, like the thing says down at the bottom of the screen there, man, trading mode has all of you kids spoiled, man. Super spoiled. Because let me tell you something. It, back in the day, like you probably can't even imagine this, but when a fighting game came out, we didn't have a lot of the internet. There wasn't a lot of internet to talk to. We didn't have any training modes. And your ability to access the game and actually test things was very, very limited. One of the most famous situations of this is when Street Fighter IV first came out and Chinatown Fair was literally the only arcade on the, ex on the East Coast that had a Street Fighter IV cabinet. So everybody who was trying to play Street Fighter IV had to wait like in a two-hour line... And you weren't allowed longer than like a three game win streak. Like if you won three games in a row, everybody game over it, and then the next two pe people jumped onto the machine. The amount of pe the ability for you to even play and to test things was basically non-existent. And it was really, really crazy. And when you think about that, when you think about how difficult it was for us to learn stuff. I got to tell you, man, that is just an indication of how strong we were as fighting game players to be able to discover as much stuff as we did. It was absolutely wild. Yeah, there were no practice modes in the arcades at all. And, you know, a lot of times when you're sitting there streaming or you're playing and something weird happens in the game, you're like, wait, wait, someone clipped that and you go back and you try to replicate it and stuff like that we've had situations where in alpha 2 where chun li's kokosho like froze on the screen and like was just like sitting there floating in the sky and then like you saw it and you're like wait what and then it went away and then you had to forget about it that was the end of it like what what were we going to do to try to replicate it it was going to cost way too much money to try to figure out how to replicate whatever just happened. We couldn't go back and see what led to it or anything like that. It was really crazy. And so the amount of information that we could get was so difficult. And the funniest thing is it really also depended on your friends and which arcade you went to because there were so many different styles of people playing the fighting games. I was very fortunate that during my formative years of fighting games, you know, when I was writing FAQs and stuff like that, I was going to UCLA and their arcade was awesome. And everybody you saw at the arcade were the same people that you saw pretty much every day. And so you weren't going to like hate people. You weren't going to start fights with them. You could certainly dislike them, but everyone kind of got along. And so one of the most common things people used to do would be like, all right, let's play fighting games. 
You sit down. You have never seen this game before in your life. It just showed up in the arcade and you're like, shit, what do I do? You look at the cabinet. Your character may or may not have their special moves or even all of their special moves listed on the cabinet. And so you're like, all right, let me see what this character does. And a lot of times what would happen is you would play against the other guy. Because you have no idea what you're doing, you would get destroyed in round one and in round two. And then right before you died in round two, you'd be like, hey, 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 can I test some stuff? And the other guy would be like, sure, no problem. And so they would just sit there and then you would just test out special moves. And you'd be like, hey, wait, throw a fireball. I want to see if this is projectile invul. And then you would test to see if projectile invul. Dude, Hatson is going to tell us if moves are projectile invulnerable on FAT like the day that Street Fighter VI comes out. Like in a month, we're going to have the properties of everything that is like anti-air invul, projectile invul, strike invul, throw invul in like two weeks, dude. We're going to have that on our phone. And when we were playing fighting games in the arcade, dude, like you just were just like, hey, let's try that. Or, or someone would come up to you and be like, yo, the guy's throwing fireballs. Did you know this move went through projectiles? You'd be like, yo, thanks. You know, like it really was a word of mouth. But if you found someone who was nice enough to let you experiment like that, and then you would go to round three and then you would experiment. He would let you guys, he would let you experiment, but then you always let him kill you because he officially did beat you in round two. And so then you would be like, hey, thanks, man. And then you'd get off the machine. And that kind of cycle would happen a lot with people. People would just be like, hey, can I try this? Hey, can I uh, check this out? And this is way past the tick throw thing, flashy flash. That was Street Fighter 2. We're already in the Alpha 1, Alpha 2, Alpha you know, 3, that kind of era at this point. We were largely already kind of over that uh, situation. But it was really interesting because sometimes, like I said, I went to a college arcade where we all knew each other. You, don't, you weren't necessarily that lucky sometimes. There were a lot of arcades where there was that one guy who found the cheapest thing in the game <laughs> at the very beginning... They were like, oh my God, this thing is so broken. And again, when you went to an arcade, like getting a win streak in the arcade wasn't just about like bragging rights. It saved you money. It saved you money. I put in two tokens or two quarters into a machine. I played. And if I continue to win, I wouldn't be spending any money. And so sometimes you would just go to the arcade and there's that asshole who only knows one super powerful thing, and while nobody knows what they're doing with their characters yet, he's just around one fight, and he just murders you with that thing, and then that's it. You don't get a chance to experiment at all. And honestly, if you did not have access to an arcade that had more than one cabinet, you were kind of screwed. Like, you didn't have any real way to figure out the games. Like, it's really difficult. Now, one of the things that a lot of people would do, and I did this a lot, as when I was in college as well, at the college arcade, I would show up in the mornings at 8 a.m. when the arcade opened. What's up, FGC Fabinho? Thank you for the subscription. I'm assuming you are from Brazil. Thank you very much. Uh, hope you are doing well. Uh, but again, I would go to the arcade at 8 o'clock in the morning when it opened. Nobody was there. It's college. Who woke up at 8 a.m. in college? So I would go to the arcade at 8 a.m. and I would just play against the computer all day and test stuff. That's how I wrote those FAQs, man. When I wrote like Children of the Atom FAQs, Marvel Super Heroes FAQs, I just went into the arcade and I just sat there and just tried stuff. Different characters all the time. I pick another character, try this, pick another character, figure out how this works and stuff like that. And you could learn a lot in those situations. You know, you could actually figure a lot of things out and figure out how to play a lot of those characters. I also had the advantage that on the weekends at the campus arcade, they had free play sessions where I would pay $3. Uh, oh, no, it was $5. You'd pay $5 and you every machine was set on free play for three hours. So, for example, that was how I discovered how flipping worked in Alpha 3. If you actually look at my FAQ for uh, Alpha 3, I drew an ASCII flowchart and exactly how flipping worked and when you could flip. And we learned right away what neutral state was and stuff like that in the corner you know, the corner changing it so that you can't flip anymore, turning you invincible, all that stuff. My brother and I did that by going to one of those free play sessions, both paying $5 and then just sitting there and just testing it. 
we were just testing it. Like, when can you flip? Wait, what? Why does that work? Wait, how come I can't flip here? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And so we would actually do that. And that's why I wrote the FAQs because I had that advantage and I wanted to disseminate all the information to as many people as possible. But if you didn't have access to the internet back then, we didn't have Twitter or anything. Like it was literally like you would have to know where to look on GameFAQs or where to go look on brawl.mindlink.net or something like that, or like in the news groups and stuff, like it was hard to find information, which is why showyoucan.com was such a game changer for the FGC because it created a giant hub for everybody to go to. Showyoucan.com really changed how fighting games were perceived. Someone asked me this question one time, but that's really where the FGC started. The fighting game community was created because of Shoryuken.com and the forums. Previous to that, it was like news groups and people were just here and there, whatever. It wasn't really a community, but Shoryuken.com was when it was when we first really started sharing tech and learning and, and teaching and stuff like that. So that was where the community aspect really started. But it's just really crazy to me because a lot of people today like don't realize how hard it was to learn fighting games back in the day. Like when a new game, and sometimes like right now, like Street Fighter VI is coming out June 2nd, we have betas and people are excited and let's face it, some people have hacks and cracks out there and stuff like that. People are actually like learning so much information in anticipation of June 2nd. We didn't even know a game was coming out until we showed up at the arcade. I had never heard of some of these fighting games and you walk up into the arcade and all of a sudden there's this X-Men children. I remember when they were rolling X-Men children in the Atom out there. And I was like, what? Whoa, this is crazy. This is the wildest thing. And then someone learned you could drill claw with uh, Wolverine and when he bounced off, he could still hit buttons on the way down. And so that guy just drill claw fierced everybody to death. Nobody could beat him. <laughs> But yeah, like, I, I didn't even know that game was coming out and it showed up. Iceman was in it, and I was a big Iceman fan because of uh, Spider-Man and his amazing friends. I used to watch that with Spider-Man, Iceman, and Firestar. So I was like, oh, Iceman, and he had the giant move where he summoned the ice ball from the sky and it dropped on your head, and I couldn't figure out how to do that move at all. I would just be playing, and then I would accidentally do something, and then I would form the ball in the sky, and I was just like... How am I doing this? Quarter circle forward, no. Quarter circle back, no. DP, down, down. What is the motion for this? And the motion was hit two buttons of the same strength. So it was jabbing, jabbing short or, or uh, strong and forward or fierce and roundhouse. But that motion didn't exist. That motion literally, oh, dude, those sprites from Children of the Atom are so beautiful, dude. Super beautiful. Dude, in Children of the Atom, one of the best tactics early on was Psylocke going super jump and going, side blast, side blast, side blast, side blast, side blast, side blast, jump up, side blast, side blast, side blast, side blast. And like, if you got hit by Storm's tornado from a screen away, you would bounce and reel in a way that the next tornado was a true meaty. And some people would keep trying a hit button so she would just go typhoon bam typhoon bam typhoon bam typhoon bam typhoon bam unless you were stubborn enough to finally just block the second typhoon otherwise there was like nothing you could do you literally were forced to block the second typhoon and like there dude it it is so crazy how hard it was to learn fighting games back then and you know again this is just kind of one of the things that I want to talk about, talk more about this, like talk about things that people probably didn't consider. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and end it here because I feel like I've kind of gotten to the topic pretty well. I didn't want to make this video particularly long, but is there anybody in the chat that has any questions about what it was like trying to learn tech back then? When training mode first came out in Alpha 1 on the home system, I was like, this is the greatest invention ever. There was like two options. 
If you wanted a test meter, you had to start training mode and go, show you can, 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 level one, show you can, 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 level two, show you can, show you can, level three. That's how you built meter in training mode in alpha one. There was no option. There was only auto guard. There was no option for not auto guard. Dude, it was terrible. The training mode was awful and it was the greatest thing ever. I found out so much through that alpha one training mode. I found out so much information with that training mode. It was the coolest thing ever, dude. Like I, I was a kid in a candy store as a person who used to play on the Super Nintendo and put the second controller on the ground and block with my toes. I would start a combo and then with my big toe, I would press down back and keep the combo going to see if I did the combo right. That is the techniques we had to use back in the Super Nintendo version of the day, of back in the days of Super Nintendo. And again, in the arcades, I had an advantage too because I also had an older brother who was also very interested in system mechanics and stuff. So like when we did the Alpha 3 flipping thing, like he was just as curious about it as I was. It wasn't like I was dragging my brother to help me. We both wanted to test it and figure it out. And we were two of the people who figured it out before anybody else did. We were some of the people who literally first figured out the whole concept of neutral state in Alpha 3 and why when Zangief Larry did you, you couldn't flip. But when like other people hit you with moves that you could flip almost instantaneously because we discovered the concept of neutral state. In fact, neutral state, now that I think think about it is a James Chen term. I created the term neutral state in Street Fighter in my Alpha 3 guide. Now that I think about it, that's just like trip guard. Like neutral state is literally a J. Chen's or patented term. Like I was the first one who created, who invented that term. You know, like, and this was because I was just a scientist. I just really, really, really wanted to study all these kind of things. So it was, it was just really, really crazy how hard it was to learn fighting games back in the day but uh again if you enjoy this kind of content if you want to hear more about like i feel like this was i barely scratched the surface but you know again i think this is a lot of information i think a lot of people really uh enjoyed i mean i, I hope people really enjoy this kind of thing so if you do want to hear more about this kind of stuff if you want to hear more about history and just what it was like playing fighting games a long time ago arcade era you know the different types of players that you would run into in the arcade like i was just joking about earlier and stuff you know, let me know in the comments below. Please tell me about it. Then tweet out this video because the more people that watch this video, the more, you know, people will come to my channel and expect this kind of content, the more I will create uh, this kind of stuff. So if you guys do enjoy this, please let me know in the contents and, and tell everybody and watch it. I mean, I see uh, Capone in the chat saying more. Bretonian says, I love your fighting game, history lectures, etc., etc. So hopefully you guys did enjoy this. But again, it's just so different how it is for back then and how it is nowadays. But since I lived through it, it's hard for me to quantify it. So a lot of times I forget how different it is. So it's hard for me to think of how to talk about it. I, I'm not sure what spurred this one on. I was like, this might be kind of an interesting thing to talk about it. Thank you, Alrico. Um, but uh hope you guys enjoyed this hope you guys had fun again check out my cami versus manon analysis over here the next day uh tomorrow uh the tekken 8 uh june and jack 8 video should be up by then uh, i'm not putting up this preview if you're looking for this because by the time these videos go up i think evo japan will have already started so there's no point in that but again if you guys uh, enjoy yes this is very similar to the okay sonic boomer stuff abnormal abnormal uh, and that's kind of what i'm trying to bring back right now so i have a question was the community tighter unified more now or back then it's it's different because the communities were smaller and they were arcade based and so there were still factions within arcades a lot of the times so honestly i would say that the community is infinitely tighter now than it was back then it was really disparate back then. There were factions inside of arcades. Arcades didn't communicate. 
Very few people shared information, and there was a very there was a very rivalistic kind of nature through a lot of stuff. And so maybe you and your best friend and another guy were the three best in the arcade, and you guys were the community of that arcade. And so you guys are the bestest buds and are still friends today, and that's super tight knit. But that was like it. You hated everybody else who came and invaded your arcade and stuff like that. So it's a very, very different kind of environment and a very, very different kind of feel of how it is to how it is now. Now it's literally there is a community and we will support each other and we are trying to help each other grow. And you have people like me who are going to teach you how to play fighting games in an interactive environment like that. So it's definitely different. So. There is more of an esports atmosphere right now, but that's not what made it different. It's not it's not because of esports that we are a lot more friendlier with each other and stuff. Honestly, it's because a lot of the people who grew up in that environment who are still playing fighting games right now love fighting games and want as many people to play fighting games as as we can. And we don't want people who are learning fighting games now to grow up in that same environment that we did because it kind of sucked in some ways. It was great, but it, it sucked in a lot of ways. And we want everybody to playing this, be playing this. We want everybody to see how much fun it is. And we're the ones running things now. And because of that, we have the ability to shift the focus that way, the way we want to. Long before esports, like I said, during showyoucan.com era, we were already doing better by trying to bring in younger players into the community, you know. So that's, that's just kind of the way it works. So, in any case... Thank you guys for watching. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want more historical content like this. I will continue to try to think of topics for you guys and I can't promise something every week because like I said, it's really hard for me having been through it all to realize what's actually worth significantly talking about. But uh, again, thank you guys for tuning in. And if you guys enjoy this, like and subscribe. And click that little bell icon so you know when new videos go live. And I uh, hope you guys enjoy this a lot. Uh, and again, for those of you watching this on YouTube and on Twitch over here, thank you for continued support of uh, the Tuesday show. I'm sorry, uh, it was Tuesday podcast here. I have to remember it was Tuesday because for you, the day this podcast graced your presence was the most important day of your life. But for me, it was Tuesday. <laughs>